Today I want to talk about something that is really fun. Should you let a monkey run your portfolio? I'm Dr. Tom Stark and today I want to talk to you about this. But before we actually answer that question, should you let a monkey run your portfolio, we first have to look into why you should probably do this or why it would be a good idea at all. Now in order to understand it a little bit better, please have a look at the next chart. This actually shows the out, or uh, I should say underperformance of all the US equities funds uh, for different um, asset allocations. Now what they are specifically is not really important and you can have a look uh, at the source down here in order to figure that out. But what you can see is that most of these equity funds, more than half of them, usually underperform. Now in the last few years, as you can see, the underperformance has gone down a bit, but it's still way above 50%. Now interestingly, according to the S&P Global, only 34.11% of large cap mutual funds that existed in the last 15 years are around today. So what does this mean? Well, it means that in the data that we see, we actually have a huge survivorship bias. And this chart is really interesting because it actually shows the survivorship of all the different types of equity funds that exist and uh, how they did in the last 20 years. And you can see that the survivorship uh, is actually quite low. So in the lowest case, it's less or it's just around the 20% mark. And in the highest case, it's around 47%. So no, no uh, case has more than a 50% survival rate of the funds in the last 20 years. So that means that what we see in or what we saw in the previous chart, that we actually have to then uh, add the fact that many of the funds uh, in that chart don't exist anymore. So in reality, the outperformance rate of uh, those funds is much, much lower. And in fact, um, some papers talk about a outperformance rate of only about uh, two to six percent, which is then quite well in agreement uh, with uh, the chart that we see on this page here. So that means, well, you know, if we have such a low outperformance of the underlying index, the question is, well, could we just uh, get a monkey uh, to throw some darts at a board uh, with stock names and then trade those stock names uh, that the monkey randomly selected? And this is what I've done, obviously, in a more quantitative method. And the way it works is this. Once a month, we select n random stocks from the S&P 500 constituents. So that could be, be between 10 and 300 stocks of the S&P 500. Then all these n stocks are equally weighted, unlike the S&P 500, which is market cap weighted. And we rebalance uh, this portfolio every month. So it means every month we select a new set of n stocks. Now, getting the S&P constituents for each month is a little bit tricky. And the way I have done it is to use Wikipedia for that purpose. On Wikipedia, you can actually get an actualized list of all the S&P constituents that are currently available. Now, this is great, but if we just use those all the way back into the past, let's say back 20 years, then again, we would have a real problem because the S&P constituents right now are the real winners as companies in the last whatever decade or 20 years. So we would have a huge bias in that list already. Now in order to not do that, we have to look at the historical constituents in the S&P 500. Luckily, we've actually got on the same Wikipedia page also the changes in the list of S&P 500 components. So we can take these changes as well and then apply them backwards from the current list all the way to the beginning or to where that list actually ends. And this is what I've done. 
I've copied and pasted these tables into a CSV file and then passed that CSV file into Python and then passed the second table with the changes as well and then created my constituents for each month. So each change or each number of changes per month then uh, give me the new portfolio in, into history. Now I know that this is not actually perfect because some of the changes that have happened there are not really reported by Wikipedia. But what I do know is that up until 2014 this list is actually quite accurate. So most of my statistical analysis that comes in the next section is actually mostly starting from 2014. All right, and so this is a chart that shows us the performance of 250 of these uh, monkey portfolios. And when I say 250 monkey portfolios, what I mean is this is the performance of a uh, portfolio that changes once a month. So in these charts, each of these lines uh, actually shows uh, a updated portfolio every month. So in fact, we have a lot more than 250 portfolios, but we have 250 uh, PNL traces. And what you can see is that a lot of these PNL traces outperform the thick black line, which is the SPY benchmark. But then you also can see that there's probably quite a few that underperform. Now from this chart, we can't really say exactly how many there are. So we need to go a little bit further in our analysis and see what the actual outperformance looks like. And this is uh, the, prob uh, the profit uh, distribution for this period. So this is the distribution of the final profits. And you can see that there's a nice distribution. You can see there's some that are quite low on the left side and then there's some of these uh, lines that really, really have quite high returns probably because they just selected a lucky number of equities and this is most likely by pure chance. Now what's interesting here is that you can see that the uh, mean of the randomly uh, selected portfolio returns overall is quite a bit higher than the uh, final SPY return. So in fact over the, uh, over the uh, years from 2014 we got a 60% outperformance of these uh, monkey portfolios on average uh, than the return of the SPY, which is quite significant. Now, the question is, of course, how many uh, stocks should we include in our portfolio? And this is what I did here. I generated this chart. So I ran about a thousand runs each for uh, different numbers of stocks in each single portfolio, starting from 10 stocks in a portfolio all the way to 300. And what we can see here is that the uh, probability of outperformance is fairly consistent, interestingly, uh, between 60 and 70%. As expected for the lower numbers, it's a bit lower, but then as we go to higher numbers, it's actually you know a little bit up and down, uh, but not too much. So now we should ask ourselves, can we actually make a strategy out of this? Can we build a strategy that is purely based on a monkey throwing darts or several monkeys throwing darts and then consistently outperform uh, the S&P 500? Because obviously there's quite a few strategies that don't necessarily outperform the S&P 500 and we've only got a around two thirds or, or 60 to 70 percent outperformance. Now have a look at the next chart. Here what I did is I chose uh, 20 different uh, traces or 20 different uh, portfolios in parallel. So it's effectively like 20 different monkeys uh, throwing darts at a board and selecting portfolios and then put in, putting them together in a super portfolio. And we can see that the super portfolio is actually outperforming the S&P 500 quite significantly. Now you could say, wait, but this could just be a coincidence. And um, if we do this over and over again, then um, 
you know, like we might find that there's actually quite a lot of these selections that do not uh, outperform the S&P 500. And um, let's have a look uh, what it looks like when we uh, run this and randomly select uh, 20 uh, monkeys throwing darts again and again. And then uh, how this uh, compares to the performance of the S&P 500. And this is what we can see here. The uh, blue uh, bars are actually the distributions of these, uh, what I call stacked monkey portfolios. So the 20 monkeys uh, actually throwing darts versus the S&P 500. And we can see that in this case for uh, 300 of these runs, none of them actually underperforms uh, the S&P 500, which is really, really interesting. So all of them outperform, some by a larger margin, some by a less margin. So we go from a uh, return of 60% uh, to return of over 100%, uh, as you can see here. But uh, in any case, uh, we're still outperforming the underlying benchmark. And this is really quite remarkable. Now, by how much uh, would we outperform uh, the benchmark typically? So here I looked, uh, first of all, at the Sharpe ratios. And in this case, if you see, hey, wait, uh, the Sharpe ratio that I calculate is a bit different. What I actually did here is I calculated the monthly Sharpe ratio. So oftentimes uh, we use for the Sharpe ratio the daily returns, but we can use hourly returns or whatever. In this case, I used the monthly returns. And the regular SPY in this case has a sharp ratio of 0 0.49 and the monkey portfolios have a sharp ratio of 0.75, which is really, really significantly higher uh, than the benchmark. The compounded annual growth return, SPY is about 13.8% and the monkey portfolio is much, much higher by quite a few percent, 17.4%. And that is again, a significant number. Now interestingly the beta of the monkey portfolio to the SPY is still pretty high, it's 0 0.96. So we're basically exposed to the same risk uh, as the underlying SPY with our monkey portfolio. Now um, in terms of volatility we can actually see that the monkey portfolio is quite a bit more risky uh, than the SPY by th with 31% versus the SPY of 21%. But having said that, uh, the ratio of uh, returns to risk, which is the Sharpe ratio, really justifies uh, that additional risk that we might take uh, if we run a monkey portfolio. So really, these results are quite weird. And we really have to ask ourselves, what causes that outperformance? What is the real reason or driver for this? And I want to demonstrate this a little bit in the next chart. And in this chart, we show uh, the outperformance or the performance of the monkey portfolio versus the performance of the SPY, but also versus the performance of the SPY 400, which represents a basket of mid cap stocks. And when we basically pick random stocks from the S&P 500, we know that in general, we're actually weighting our or we're tilting our portfolio towards smaller market caps in the S&P 500 because the S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index and it's really dominated by the top five or 10 stocks in that index. And a lot of the other stocks in that index really are quite in insignificant. So we have a strong tilt towards smaller market caps. And what we can see here is when we look at the S&P 400, they actually outperform the S&P 500 uh, since 2011, but of course with a much, much higher volatility. And so when you look at the um, difference between say the S&P 400, the S&P 500 and the monkey portfolio, you can see that the monkey portfolio has similar performance to the S&P 400, to the mid caps, but at the same time, it has a much, much lower volatility than the mid caps. So the volatility is more closely related 
to the S&P 500, whereas the returns are more closely related to the S&P 400. So that uh, leads us perhaps to the conclusion that the um, bias towards smaller caps really helps us to get a better performance for the monkey portfolio. So what are the conclusions uh, from this analysis? Well, we have seen that statistically the monkey portfolio definitely outperforms the S&P 500. And this could probably be due to a tilt towards smaller market caps. I'm not saying that this is definitely true, but it is a real possibility. So um, we can also see that a portfolio of 20 random portfolios with 10 stocks each, as demonstrated bef before, outperforms the S&P 500 every time. So it has a really, really high prob probability of beating the benchmark, which is basically what we want when we build a strategy uh, for a funds management or so. We really want to outperform the benchmark. And this is what this can actually do with pretty high confidence. Now the question is, would you really uh, rather uh, have a portfolio that outperforms the benchmark with a high probability or an underperformance uh, almost guaranteed by a fund manager? Well, I mean, um, you, could ask, you could answer that question yourself. However, if you were a fund manager that would trade this strategy, you're almost guaranteed to get fired from your job. So if you say, well, I just trade random stocks in our, and you're a fund manager, I'm sure your investors wouldn't be very happy about that. And will probably dispose of you very quickly. All right, well, you can probably draw your own conclusions from this and you should because there isn't really a, a clear-cut answer or a clear-cut uh, conclusion that gives you a definite answer to, to what you've just seen here. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. So before you go, please don't forget to subscribe and smash the like button so we can get a bit more uh, traction on YouTube. And also don't forget to check out our other YouTube videos, uh, some of which are really quite interesting. We also have two courses in Udemy. One is a basic Python for traders and investors course where you learn a lot of quantitative techniques combined with learning the right programming skills in Python that help you to get quantitative trading right. And the second course is on futures trading and it's a very deep dive into the ins and outs of futures trading including quantitative trading and some interesting strategies that you can use in the markets. I hope you enjoyed this video and we will see you in the next video next time. Bye bye.